True Crime in Each State Part 1, starting off with Indiana, the murder of Sylvia Lichen. In 1965, Sylvia was just 16 when she was murdered by Gertrude, two of her daughters, and some of the neighborhood kids. Sylvia and her sister Jenny were staying with Gertrude because their family was on the road for work. When Sylvia's dad missed a payment to Gertrude, Gertrude started beating Sylvia. Sylvia was also refused food to the point where she was eating out of garbage bins and eating spoiled food. Most of the abuse was strictly focused on Sylvia and a lot of it was because of her physical appearance. One of Gertrude's daughter, Paula, punched Sylvia so hard in the face she broke her own wrist in the process. The neighborhood kids were also allowed to come over to beat Sylvia and burn her with cigarettes. Gertrude once carved into Sylvia's stomach with a needle, I am a prostitute and I'm proud. Sylvia eventually passed away due to many blunt force traumas to the head. Gertrude and many others were charged in her death. Unfortunately, Gertrude was actually released on parole in 1985. If you love true crime, make sure you hit that follow button and hit that heart button on this video. Thank you so much. True Crime in 50 States, part two. Pennsylvania, the murder of Choi LaFerrera. This one really just pisses me off. Miranda Barber and her husband, Elliot, met Troy through a Craigslist ad. Miranda offered to have sex with Troy for a payment of $100. On November 11, 2013, Miranda went to go meet Troy in the parking lot of a mall. Little did Troy know, something very bad was about to go down. While Miranda went to go meet Troy, Elliot was in the back of her car underneath a blanket, hiding. Once she met up with Troy, they drove about six miles out of town. Once they finally parked, Miranda signaled Troy to come to her car, and that's when Elliot jumped out, threw a cord around his neck, while Miranda stabbed him 20 times. The body was found the next day of a local resident. The couple then proceeded to dinner after killing Troy, which is absolutely just sick. The only reason why they even killed Troy is just because they wanted to kill someone together, which is just mind-blowing. Miranda has also claimed herself that she's killed over 22 people. What state should I do next? Put them in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. True Crime in Each State, Part 3. Massachusetts, The Poisonous Nursemaid. In 1885, Jan Topin began training as a nurse at Cambridge Hospital. Once she started getting close with her patients, she picked her favorite ones and started using them as guinea pigs. She wanted to see what heavy doses of medicine would do to their nervous system. In 1889, she was eventually fired from the hospital and started working as an in-home care nurse. She started her poisoning spree in 1895, poisoning her landlord and his wife just because she didn't want to pay rent. In 1899, she poisoned her foster sister. In 1901, she moved in with an elderly man to take care of him after his wife's death. Within two weeks, she killed him, his sister, and two of his daughters. After that, Jane was arrested and charged with murder. Jane admitted to 31 murders and said it was her ambition to kill more men and women than had ever lived. Even though Jane claimed her sanity in her trial, she was found not guilty for a reason of insanity. She spent the rest of her life in an insane asylum. What state should I do next? Put it in the comments below. True Crime in Each Day, Part 4. Missouri, the murder of Paula Klaus. On August 10th, 1993, it was just a normal day for Paula. Her and her 15-year-old son, Derek, had planned to go to the movies, and that's what they did. Once they got to the movies, they just went in and sat down. About 15 minutes into the movies, Derek stood up, shot his mother seven times in the head, and then walked out. People then followed him out of the movies, pointed him out to an officer where he was soon arrested. But why? Why would he do that? Derek's father, Lawrence, and Paula had recently separated. Paula got an order to restrict Larry from seeing their 11-year-old daughter. That's when Larry convinced Derek to kill his own mother. He told Derek that nothing would happen to him and then they would just receive her life insurance and run away. The day before killing Paula, Larry took Derek to practice shooting. Once Derek was arrested, Larry went to go visit him with a big smile on his face saying, I'm proud of you, son. Derek then testified against his father and they were both charged with life sentences. Comment down below what state I should do next. Thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to hit that follow button and true crime in each day, part five. Idaho, the murder of Cassie Stoddart. On September 22nd in 2006, Cassie was house sitting for her aunt and uncle while they were out of town. Cassie invited her boyfriend and two of her classmates named Brian and Tori to come over and hang out. Cassie gave them a tour of the house and then they decided to watch a movie. Tori and Brian left about halfway through the movie because they claimed they wanted to watch their own movie. What Cassie didn't know is that they unlocked the basement door so they could re-enter the home without her knowing. Later, they returned quietly wearing all black clothing and masks. They started making loud noises so Cassie would come downstairs and even turn off the light breakers so maybe that she'd come down there to turn them on. When they realized that Cassie wasn't going to come downstairs, they eventually went up to her. They smashed through the basement door, started attacking Cassie, and stabbed her 30 times. She was eventually found by her 13-year-old cousin. During the investigation, the police found out that the boys recorded themselves making the plan to kill Cassie. They were inspired to kill her from the movie Scream. They were both sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. What say should I do next? Put it in the comments below and thank you. True Crime in Each State, Part 6. 
Texas. In 1989, Andrea met Rusty Yates and they started dating. By 1993, they were happily married. Both of them had decided they wanted to have as many babies as naturally possible. Andrea gave birth to her first child in 1994. By the time of her fourth child in 1999, Andrea became really depressed. In June of 1999, she tried to commit suicide where she was admitted to a hospital and put on antidepressants. Soon after she was released, she held a knife to her neck and begged Rusty to let her die. She had two more attempts in July where she was again admitted and she was diagnosed with postpartum psychosis. Andrea's psychiatrist urged them to stop having kids, but seven weeks after she was released from the hospital, she was pregnant with her fifth and final child. Then she struggled with postpartum psychosis all over again. On June 21st, 2001, Rusty left the house for work, leaving Andrea alone with the kids, even though her psychiatrist was very against that. In the hours she was alone with the kids, she drowned all five of them. He then called the police and Rusty. Andrea is in a mental institution to this day. The Murder in Each State, Part 7, Tennessee. On November 21st, 2016, Emma Wonker, who was 16, asked her mother to wake her up at 6 a.m. for school. When her mother went to wake her, she didn't move. Her mother knew there was something instantly wrong, so she tried to find a pulse, but she couldn't find one, so she called the police. When the police arrived, they found a bullet hole in the wall of her bedroom. It was determined that Emma was shot while she was sleeping from someone outside. Once the police started questioning Emma's family and friends, only one name came up multiple times of who would want to hurt her. The person was Emma's ex-boyfriend, Riley. Riley and Emma dated on and off again for about two years. This relationship was toxic. He was controlling and possessive. Emma had officially ended their relationship and that drove him crazy. When the police spoke to Riley, he said he didn't know anyone who would want to hurt Emma. Riley's friends came forward to the police and said that Riley was out until 4 a.m. the night that Emma died. So the police and Riley's friends tried to work together to catch Riley giving up a confession. Riley then told his friend where the gun was and then he was arrested. He was sentenced to life in prison. True Crime in Each State, Part 8, Minnesota. This is Paul Stephanie. He was also known as the Weepy Voice Killer. Each time he would commit a crime, he would call the police in a high-pitched, remorseful voice to anonymously report his crimes. On December 31st, 1980, Paul severely beat Karen Potak. She had several head wounds and neck wounds. Around 3 a.m., he called the police and begged them to send help for Karen and told them exactly where she was and he was nowhere to be found. On June 3rd, 1981, he killed Kimberly Compton and again called the police to confess. On this call, he said, I don't know why I had to stab her. I'm so upset with myself. I can't stop. I keep killing somebody. They still didn't know who he was. Barbara Simmons was his last victim. He met her at a bar and ended up giving her a ride home. He stabbed her over 40 times. He again then called the police and said, please don't talk, just listen. I'm sorry I killed that girl. I stabbed her 40 times. He was then caught in 1982 from a failed attempt to kill another girl. While in jail, he also confessed to drowning Kathy Greening in her own bathtub. He then died in prison in 1998 from cancer. True Crime in Each State, Part 9, Ohio. Unfortunately, this case is pretty long, so there will be two parts, but they'll be uploaded at the same time, so let's get into it. What happened to Patricia Adkins? On June 29, 2001, Patty clocked out of work and was never seen again. Patty had plans to go on vacation to Canada with her boyfriend, who was actually married at the time. They had been having an affair on and off for years. The identity of this man is actually unknown because the police wanted to keep it confidential. As soon as she got off work, she ran out to the parking lot and jumped in the bed of his truck. They didn't want anyone to see them together and he had to give his friend a ride home, so he said, so he told her that she had to be in the bed of his truck. Patty had actually told all of her close loved ones about this relationship and said that he was going to leave his wife for her. She also told them about the vacation that they had planned together. Patty told them that he had told her on this vacation they would be va vacationing somewhere where there was no phone service so she wouldn't be able to reach out to any of her family members. He also told her not to pack anything, which is actually pretty weird. He said that they would just buy everything there. Okay, so make sure you check out part two, which is already posted to my page. Part two of the missing case of Patricia Atkins. When the police questioned this boyfriend about Patty, he claimed that he barely knew her. He also said that since he didn't know her, he definitely didn't have plans to go on vacation with this girl. He said that on the night that she went missing, he got off work, they, him and his friend drove 30 miles out of town, went to Burger King, and they waited 45 minutes in line to get their food, and then he went home. Burger King did come out and say that this is absolutely not true, that they were not busy around this time. His wife also backed the story and said he came home around 2 a.m., which was normal. This man did give the police permission to search his home for evidence. When they did, they found a new truck bed cover in his garage. He bought it on the 26th, and he started using it on the 29th, which is the same night that Patty went missing. Also, when searching the home, they found a ton of gifts that Patty had given him over the years, which contradicted the story that he didn't know her. He ended up taking a polygraph test and failed. Shortly after this, he quit his job and never returned back to work. Patty was legally declared dead in 2006 and her case remains unsolved.